We will now come to order. Without objection, the chairman is authorized to declare recess at any time. Before I deliver my opening remarks, I wanted to note that today the committee is meeting both in person and virtually. I want to announce a couple of reminders to the members about the conduct of this hearing. First, members and staff who are attending in person may choose to be masked, but it is not a requirement. However, any individuals with symptoms of positive tests or exposure to someone with COVID-19 should wear a mask while present. Members who are attending virtually should keep their video feed on as long as they are present in the hearing. Members are responsible for their own microphones. Please also keep your microphones muted unless you are speaking. Finally, if members have documents they wish to submit for the record, please email them to the committee clerk whose email address was circulated prior to the hearing. Good morning, and thank you to Undersecretary Richmond for joining us today to discuss the science and energy research infrastructure needs of the Department of Energy. We're holding this hearing to examine the goals and impacts of the DOE's budget requests for 2023 with particular attention to impacts on the construction and upgrade of user facilities and large-scale experiments managed by the DOE Office of Science. That said, questions concerning programs and activities carried out by other DOE offices will, of course, also be welcome. I want to start off by emphasizing that we are in a climate emergency. As the most recent IPCC report has reminded us yet again, in response, we need urgent, transformative action from Congress and the administration. We need a clean energy revolution. I thank the White House and DOE leadership for the important steps they are taking to restructure the agency. Think outside the box and mobilize our resources and expertise to kickstart that revolution. This is evident in several aspects of the fiscal year 2023 budget requests, and I would specifically like to note my appreciation for the integrated approach to research, development, demonstration, and deployment that is shaping strong investments at the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. For example, and from solar manufacturing to home electrification, we need to center the communities that have been most harmed and neglected by the fossil fuel economy. I also welcome very strongly the continued emphasis on equity and implementing Justice 40. Let's keep going bigger on all of this. And I strongly believe that to achieve our goals and reach our full potential as a society, we need to invest as ambitiously as possible across the entire science, technology, and innovation ecosystem. Unfortunately, the fiscal year 2020 requests underinvest in one crucial part of that ecosystem, DOE's Office of Science. The Office of Science is the lead federal agency supporting scientific research for energy applications and is the nation's largest supporter of research in the physical sciences. This agency has two principal thrusts, direct funding for scientific research and the development and operation of large-scale experiments and scientific user facilities. These assets and activities collectively serve tens of thousands of investigators across hundreds of different entities, both domestically and internationally. In doing so, they play a pivotal role in driving advancements in transformative new clean energy technologies, while also helping unlock the science behind some of our most fundamental mysteries, including the very nature of matter, energy, space, and time. For example, the office's light source facilities enable detailed characterization of new materials for next generation batteries. The office also leads the U.S. contribution to the International ITER project, which could greatly accelerate progress towards the realization of fusion energy generation. In short, the Office of Science provides the bedrock on which DOE develops a broad range of advanced technologies. The health of the Office of Science is a top priority for the Energy Subcommittee and the committee as a whole. 
we have passed numerous pieces of bipartisan legislation concerning the office during the 117th Congress, including a comprehensive authorization that seeks to leverage the office's assets to unleash innovation and tackle the problems of our time. In addition, we have held several hearings examining the office's portfolio and conducted oversight through other channels, including briefings and meetings with DOE and White House officials to convey the important role the office will play in achieving the administration's goals on climate, clean energy, and more. This is why I am concerned by and disappointed with the administration's fiscal year 2023 budget request for the office. Under this proposal, many current major construction projects would not be supported at levels that are needed to maintain their project schedules and minimize their total costs. This problem is pervasive, affecting projects relevant to many scientific fields, from particle physics to fusion energy, and at numerous national labs, including the electron, excuse me, electron collider and future upgrades to the National Synchrotron Light Source 2 at Brookhaven National Laboratory in New York. The resulting delays and increased price tags caused by a lackluster, lackluster budget impede scientific progress and deny DOE's internal and external research communities access to the most up-to-date instrumentation. Furthermore, they raise alarm among the department's contractors and collaborators, both domestic and international, about its commitment to these projects. Budget requests that propose cuts, stagnation, or slow growth to the office's top line also cause downward pressure on the research programs, which is leading to adverse long-term effects. The Office of Science plays a key role in advancing scientific discovery here and around the world, and it is, it is a major contributor to the workforce pipeline that enables DOE to fulfill its mission and that is needed to address the climate crisis. I also believe these research programs are a powerful tool for broadening participation and increasing equity in STEM, which is an issue I am particularly passionate about. With that in mind, I would like to see future budget requests from the administration that employ the same approach taken by the committee in the Department of Energy Science for the Future Act, which formed one of the cornerstones of the, of the America Competes Act. Our top priority, executed in a bipartisan manner, was to provide policy direction and authorize funding levels that would empower the Office of Science to adequately meet the financial requirements inherent to both its research and construction portfolios. These bills would enable large-scale construction projects to be completed on time and on budget and would expand the office's research enterprise in a way that would encourage more young people to enter scientific fields and diversify the department's workforce. I'll note that the administration wholeheartedly endorsed both of these bills, and so I hope that going forward, they will match rhetoric with action. Thank you again, and I look forward to this discussion. The chair now recognizes Mr. Weber for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for convening this, convening this hearing on this important topic. We are facing serious threats to our country's energy security, its reliability, as well as affordability. Just ask anyone who has filled up their car with gas recently or suffered through a power outage in re freezing weather. These are complex problems, but we will not solve them unless we are willing to confront the underlying basic scientific questions and technical roadblocks. And there is no one better positioned to do that than the United States Department of Energy. And that's why we're glad we're, you're here. <laughs> the Department's Office of, Soci of Science is our country's largest supporter of basic research in physical sciences and takes on today's toughest fundamental challenges in physics, in chemistry, in material science, biology, and computer science. DOE's 28 scientific user facilities house the advanced equipment required for cutting-edge research such as high-power lasers, particle accelerators, and advanced supercomputers. These are capabilities that only the federal government is 
set to provide. If we fail to sustain our support for these tremendous resources, we are not only squandering our previous investments, but putting our clean energy future, our national security, and our international competitiveness at risk. The Chinese Communist Party is open about their ambition to replace the United States as the world's scientific as well as economic leader. Russia's aggressive actions in Ukraine have sparked global instability and economic uncertainty. If we allow our research infrastructure to fall behind, our international rivals will gain control of the most crucial emerging industries and we will no longer attract top international talent to our institutions. Folks, I have championed the importance of basic research throughout my time on the Science Committee. I, I would say that I feel like a broken record, but it still appears that nobody's gotten that message. For fiscal year 2023, the Department of Energy has requested a less than 5% increase for the Office of Science. Let that sink in less than 5%. Meanwhile, the department has requested a 56% increase for ARPA-E and includes massive increases for activities within EERE, like a 44% increase for the Vehicle Technologies Office, an 84% increase for the Solar Energy Technologies Office, and a whopping 200% increase for the Wind Energy Technologies Office. I fear that this request is not sufficient to support the numerous construction projects and upgrades required to maintain the Office of Science's top-of-the-line facilities and address emerging challenges for these projects. Instead, the proposal appears to be more focused on Green New Deal talking points than on what we call mission-critical Department of Energy needs. How many clean energy innovations will come from increased funding for corporate support programs and solar energy soft cost reduction? I can answer that. None. Dare I say they won't see the light of day. I look forward to hearing more about this request and how the department plans to maintain its commitment to our critical research infrastructure and user facilities. We cannot shy away from asking those tough questions and pushing for specific answers at these hearings. We have a responsibility to our constituents to ensure our federal agencies are stewarding their hard-earned dollars responsibly. Additionally, while we have done a lot of good work in Congress and at this committee that Sherman talked about, to support the department's research enterprise, failure to invest our federal funds wisely will actually undermine that progress process. I'm sorry, progress and process. I'm also looking forward to learning more about the myriad changes announced for the department. To date, Congress has re received few details on how the department-wide reorganization will actually impact coordination between program offices and how newly created program offices will cooperate with existing ones to administer R&D programs and prevent duplicative efforts. Cross-cutting issues such as grid security and critical mineral availability require efficient communication and seamless cooperation among program offices, so we must come out of this hearing with a clearer view of this new structure. Under Secretary Richmond, uh, we want to say thank you for your testimony today, and I'm especially glad to see you here in person, with or without a mask. <laughs> I look forward to working with you to maximize the value of our federal R&D investments. And, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Weber. Is Chairwoman Johnson present? Mr. We Chair, will. Mr. Chairman, may I take personal privilege? We want to say to our great chair, one of the full science committee, that we hope the best for her, want the best for her. We're sorry that she's not here, and that we're praying for her, and I yield back. Thank you for that, Mr. Weber. If there are members who wish to submit additional opening statements, your statements will be added to the record at this point. At this time, I would like to introduce our witness, Dr. Geraldine Richmond, is the Undersecretary for Science and Innovation at the Department of Energy. In this role, she oversees DOE's Office of Science, as well as research and development in renewable energy, nuclear energy, 
carbon management, energy efficiency, and grid modernization, among other areas. She also oversees DOE's national laboratories and their facilities. Dr. Richmond is currently on leave from the University of Oregon, where she holds the Presidential Chair in Science and Professor of Chemistry. She has been honored by many awards, including the National Medal of Science, the Priestley Medal from the American Chemical Society, and the Linus Pauling Medal Award. She has served two terms as a presidential appointee to the National Science Board and has also been president of the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences. A, long, a, long, a career long advocate for underrepresented groups in STEM fields, she is the founding director of a grassroots organization called the Committee on the Advancement of Women Chemists, or COACH, that has helped over 25,000 women scientists and engineers in career advancement in the US and in dozens of developing countries around the world. Thank you for joining us today. As our witness should know, you will have five minutes for your spoken testimony. Your written testimony will be included in the record for the hearing. When you have completed your spoken testimony, we will begin with questions. Each member will have five minutes to question the panel. Dr. Richmond, please begin. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here uh, personally today, too. Um, we've been quarantined for so long, and I wish health to all members who uh, might be under the weather, weather with whatever is going around. So as members of this committee know, the Office of Science, uh, or SC, uh, is the cornerstone of the U.S. research system. Through basic and use-inspired research, the Office of Science is making critically important advances, as you've pointed out, in science and technology that support our economic and national security, including a just and equitable clean energy and climate change transition. SC is the largest federal sponsor of basic research in the physical sciences and takes the lead in fundamental scientific research for our energy future. I myself have been blessed with having funding for my own research program at the Department of Energy for over 30 years. So I appreciate the Office of Science very much for all the students that that's produced now that have gone further. The President's FY 2023 budget request for science grows investments and in administration priorities, including the basic research we still need to meet challenges in the areas of climate change and clean energy, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and biopreparedness. This, this supports the launch of three new research initiatives, bleh, initiatives, science, energy, earth shots, funding for accelerated inclusive research fair, and the accelerated innovations in emerging technologies, or accelerate. It also supports continued funding for priorities areas, including microelectronics, critical minerals, quantum information science, exascale computing, fundamental science to transform, transform manufacturing, and accelerator science and technology and the Office of Science request for reaching a new energy sciences workforce, Renew, is doubled from the FY2022 appropriation to expand targeted efforts to diversify the scientific workforce, and may I point out, especially at HBCUs. At the same time, uh, these investments position the Office of Science to operate across programs and beyond traditional silos and help build a science workforce that looks like America. At the same time, this proposed budget balances competing priorities across the Office of Science portfolio. It supports research to advance frontiers of science, as well as the construction and upgrade of world-leading scientific user facilities and their operation and maintenance. This request supports the next generation of scientific tools to maintain U.S. leadership in scientific discovery and technology development to support our nation's economic competitiveness and to foster our national security. So with that, I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Under Secretary Richmond. I will begin the round of questioning, and just to let you know, I have three questions. We're going to try and get to all of them as quickly as possible. That's fine. Great. Thank you so much for being with us today. As I laid out in my opening statement, the President's fiscal year 23 budget request for the Office of Science raises concerns for this committee. It is simply not enough to support the current needs of the office's facilities, research programs, and the national laboratories that it stewards. My understanding is that is that underinvestment in the Office of Science has been a longer trend that my colleagues have been observing and asking about for several years now, though of course we know that you have only recently begun your tenure at the DOE. 
Can you walk us through how the administration arrived at only a 4.3% increase for the Office of Science, especially in comparison to the major increases proposed for DOE's applied energy programs and the National Science Foundation? Well, thank you for that question. Again, I am a new, bit of a newbie uh, to the process, and, uh, but I, I must say that we still consider this a strong budget request. And it does follow the priorities of the administration, the Biden administration, in putting forth uh, funding for, especially for climate change and equity issues. And so in developing that, uh, re that funding request, uh, which is really just a blueprint uh, we, uh, given to the administration, we really look forward to being able to make progress in many of the areas we continue to be the, in the forefront of with the existing uh, budget request and look forward to working with you to see how we can even go further uh, with regards to uh, making sure that we have a strong and robust uh, Office of Science budget and facilities and search and operations. Thank you very much. Uh, it is also my understanding that because of the persistent budget constraint issues we are seeing in the President's request for the Office of Science, the Office's strategy for estimating project costs involves annual self-editing of the project funding profiles to fit within a relatively low, arbitrary top-line funding level for the office that DOE believes is achievable. In other words, this hasn't been a bottom-up process where you look at the obligations, needs, and research opportunities of the office and base a budget request on that, but more of a top-down one. Are you aware of this strategy, and do you know if the department has plans to improve it? Can you commit to improving this process? Thank you for that question. This is a really important issue that you raise. And again, coming into the department now as new, I've been working with the Office of Science to do real baselining, the actual costs of being able to understand. And, and, and the reason this is important, not only for the issues that you raise with regards to whether it's change practices or not, but we have just been through two years of COVID that has changed the way we even think about how we operate our facilities or need to operate our facilities, whether it be adding AI to the, to the way that we do things at our facilities as well as, as remote. But we still have to have the staffing to do that. And so I've been working diligently with the Office of Science to re-baseline all of the facilities and the operations from the bottom up so we know truly what number we need to be going into. And so I absolutely am committed to this, and I thank you for raising the, quest, the issue and also looking forward to working with you on this. This is really important. Thank you for that answer. Very exciting to hear, to hear that. My colleagues may have further follow-ups, but I'd like to switch gears a little bit. One of my priorities as chair of this subcommittee has been advancing a vision for energy justice. And we have spent a good deal of time examining and legislating on how to apply that vision to our country's scientific and climate research activities specifically. I want to commend the department for recently rolling out a new research initiatives involving urban integrated field laboratories. This initiative will fund new observational modeling and simulation studies to improve the accuracy of community scale climate research and inform equitable climate solutions, including simulation of the benefits of deploying those solutions in marginalized communities across the country. I am pleased to see that funds will be going out this year and also that the fiscal year 2023 budget request proposes additional funds for this initiative. Can you talk to us about how you see energy justice reflected in this budget request? And what are your priorities when it comes to implementing the Justice 40 initiative? Well, thank you for that question too. As you noted, I've spent many years of my career, several decades, working on issues of equity in STEM. Uh, but this goes beyond that, and I'll continue to push for that, and I'm glad I have many alliances in the Department of Energy. But this goes beyond that. What the Office of Science is doing and DOE is doing is truly committed to Justice 40 and really making a concerted effort in everything we do to make sure that we are making up for uh, uh, the mistakes, can I say, in the past with regards to where we put our energy resources, where we uh, provide opportunities for those to advance in their careers, in ways I have never seen before. I mean, I've been involved with uh, leadership activities in the Department of Energy and NSF uh, for de several decades, and I have never seen 
the issues of equity and, and uh, of our energy resources all over the country, in urban areas, in rural areas like where I come from. I've never seen that before. And it just is so exciting to be in nearly every meeting and have the Justice 40 issue be raised, whether that has to do with the grid, whether that has to do with what scientists we have in our national laboratories or using our facilities or who gets solar energy panels or, for example, on, in tribal communities. I mean, that's, uh, some of the resources in our tribal communities remind me of things that I've seen in Africa. This is not acceptable. This is not acceptable, and it's, I just have to say I'm deeply proud of where the Office of Science is going and DOE in general on these issues. It makes my heart pitter-patter. Thank you so much, Dr. Richmond. I now recognize Mr. Weber for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Undersecretary Richmond, for being here and being real. I know when you're reading your remarks, you're blah, blah, and you kind of, and I don't know how you spell that, <laughs> but I'm still, you know, my tongue, my tongue gets tangled too every now and then. So thank you for being here and being real. Your excitement and enthusiasm shows. Uh, Secretary Rich, Under Secretary Richmond, it's my opinion, and I think I can safely say, the opinion of many in this room, that the DOC research facilities, like those sponsored by the Office of Science and the Office of Nuclear Energy, are truly the crown jewels of our federal research infrastructure. I'm glad to hear that you spent a lot, many years. You don't look old enough to spend that too many years. We, you know, uh, we know that maintaining and advancing these world-leading facilities is absolutely essential to our global leadership in science as well as technology. That's why it's so important that when we in Congress authorize construction of a new facility, it's c completed in a timely manner. So it should come as no surprise that I'm concerned about something in the past, what I, what, what the future versatile test reactor. After all, it was my bill with the help of our great committee here, the Nuclear, Innovation, Nuclear Energy Innovation Capabilities Act, we call it NECA of 2017, that first authorized the versatile test re, uh, reactor's construction. But here we are, <clears throat> five years later, and BTR's completion has been stalled and then tied to the success of the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program, ARDP, a program just recently authorized in 2020. So my question, Under Secretary Richmond, can you please share with us, being as detailed as possible, an update on the status of the VTR versatile test reactor and your plans to ensure its timely success? Well, thank you for that question. Uh, both of them are incredibly important to us. Um, I uh, don't have all the details in front of me. They're in these pages somewhere, but I'd love to be able to get back to you on this because this is really important. Both of these are for our future. So if you, uh, I'd love to work with you on it. Continue okay. to press me on it to get back to you uh, on it. But all I can say is that we're still committed to both of these. Some things just take a little bit longer than we would hope. Well, a couple of questions up front. You know that Russia is outstripping us in that endeavor, right? They're way ahead of us, number one. And second question, you know that Russia is not our friend. In fact, right about now, I would say that Russia is hardly anybody's friend. So that's a great, I would appreciate your commitment to doing that. Let me ask you this. What role will the ARDP, and more specifically Terra Power's Natrium Project, play in the completion of the VTR versatile test reactor? Well, I think they are coupled. Uh, I think they absolutely are coupled, and we need one We need one in order to get to the other. So again, I'd be happy to get back to you on this, and okay. you're certainly committed to it. On your issue uh, with regards to Russia, this has really changed the landscape of a lot of our programs and concerns in the Department of Energy. Uh, in my programs, and I'd be happy to talk more about that if questions arise, but this is, we are at a, a bit of a phase transition right now with regards to how we are viewing some of our resources and some of our, both the adequacies and inadequacies of some of our resources that we critically need that the Office of Science has been key to for so long, but some of them uh, sort of on the back burner. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Um, how, in that vein, how do you plan to coordinate with the Undersecretary for Infrastructure and the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations on this very work? So uh, thank you for asking that question, too, because, uh, you know, when I first came into this role, I was uh, uh, Undersecretary for Science and Energy. Uh, I had a, a broad portfolio with part of that going on to uh, S3 or the infrastructure. That said, the, the person, uh, Kathleen Hogan, who is now the acting Undersecretary for 
for uh, infrastructure. She was the one that was helping in my position before I uh, came. We are connected at the hips, if I can say that. We meet every morning uh, discussing how we can align our programs as closely as possible on all clean energy. And in fact, it's not just, it's not just the applied programs, whether it be fusion or nuclear or whatever it is in the applied programs, but also in the deployment. So this is just this way. But then I've also been working very hard on getting the Office of Science more connected better to the EERE and the FECM and the applied areas. As we put money into these different pockets, whether it be the Office of Science, uh, the applied areas, or the uh, deployment, I call them pockets, but we're trying to make it one big uh, seamless bucket. And not only because if we're going to have success, we can't be siloed, and DOE has had a history of being siloed. And so I'm working very hard to make sure that both the, in the uh, applied and um, uh, infrastructure area that we're tied very closely in making sure that everything that happens in the demonstration gets taken on to deployment. Well, well, thank you for that. And as you continue down that path uh, in cooperation and with your colleague, I appreciate that. Will you keep us updated on the progress? Because I'm very concerned about the VTR, and we'd love to, for you to keep us updated. Yeah, you know, and I can appreciate why you would be you'd be concerned about that, because it's very important, and I promise you, yeah. we will. All right. Thank yeah. you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Yeah. The chair now recognizes uh, the gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney. Well, I thank the chair for holding this hearing, and I, I thank the witness. Uh, uh, Ms. Richmond, for your work in this area, and uh, as a scientist, I couldn't be more excited about these issues than you are, but um, I, I've noticed that a lot of the numbers are lower than what we'd like to see. A lot of the increases are lower than what we'd like to see, and I'm sure that that'll come out during the rest of the hearing, but I want to focus on a couple of issues. Uh, the DOE's Biological and Environmental Research Division is doing critical work to both improve understanding of aerosol and cloud interactions with the Earth's atmosphere and to reduce uncertainty in climate models. I was glad to see specific mention in the budget of equipment refresh for the atmospheric radiation measurement research facility to collect observational data and to initiate operations for arm aerial capability. Dr. Richmond, can you elaborate a little for me, please? on DOE's plan for expanding cloud aerosol science and reducing uncertainty, including through uh, expansion of ARMS research and observational capability. Well, thank you very much for that question. You've actually hit on an area of research that I myself have worked on with regards to atmospheric uh, issues and also uh, issues regarding aerosols. So this is a really important uh, topic that the Office of Science is taking on. Uh, because as you know, uh, a lot of the climate issues are related to what's happening with aerosols. And so being able to get more, I mean, the bottom line is we need to get a lot more better predictions with regards to what's going on uh, in the atmosphere. And that's been a challenge for a very, very long time. And in fact, when I started science, we figured that most of the chemistry that was going on in the atmosphere was a bunch of little atoms and molecules bouncing off one another. But in fact, we know today that most of the chemistry is happening actually in these aerosols. And so what's and they're almost like little chemistry factories in there. And so if we don't understand what those aerosols are doing and what's happening even at their surfaces, we are not going to make progress on having predictive power. Now, how, how does that connect it to predictive power? Well, that really comes down to uh, computer modeling uh, and being able to even use AI to advance our understanding of what's happening uh, in the atmosphere and also in the climate. And I think I'm just really excited to see more emphasis being put on this because there's some phenomenal scientists in this country, I know many of them, uh, who are far smarter than I am, that really just do amazing work and they are anxious to be able to take it to the point of being able to really help on the climate change issue. So I want to thank you very much for that question. And we continue to want to work with you as much as we can on this. Well, thank you. Uh, I've got two more questions. Um, within the Office of Science Stewarded National Labs, almost half of the buildings and two thirds of the supporting infrastructure are rated as substandard. Uh, at the Lawrence Berkeley Lab, which is near my district, 30% of the total space has a seismic rating of poor or very poor. Now this presents a real danger to employees and guests. Uh, in your written testimony, you acknowledge that there's a backlog of more than $880 million 
in deferred maintenance, which directly impacts the mission uh, and staff. Um, given the significant backlog, can you discuss the budget request for the Science Laboratories Infrastructure Program, which at 225 million would represent a 12% decrease from fiscal year 22? Well, uh, this is indeed a critically important issue with regards to infrastructure, and we're really trying very hard to um, to make a way to make way with this. But you know, it's it's a problem that's been here for a long time. But we also know that while we've uh, strived to maintain a balanced portfolio that includes uh, optimal funding for facilities projects, tough decisions had to be made, and these tough decisions and funding trade-offs are what we have here with regards to supporting the administration and the department's uh, priorities. But that said, uh, the administration really is keen, trying very, very hard to think about, and certainly the Department of Energy, think very hard about how these, we tackle these infrastructure issues because they are impacting our facilities in ways and, and other projects that are just really hard to, to manage. And in fact, I remember that there was an estimate of if we continue to increase, uh, even though we've, this is what the best that we could do in this budget uh, period, we know that we have to do much, much more if we're going to take care of this backlog. But again, there was a trade-off between really trying to catalyze a lot of these, uh, these um, climate change issues to catalyze them now. Because I only, have, I only have a few seconds left and I can barely see the clock against the yellow background. Uh, do you believe the administration on fusion, uh, something I'm also very excited about, do you think, believe the administration's proposed budget of 3 million is sufficient to support the development of inertial fusion for energy applications, even though this is called out uh, in, in the, in, in the uh, language, in the lit language? Yes, well, uh, I just actually got back late last night from an RPE fusions uh, event in San Francisco, and the excitement around fusion is just incredible, and the amount of money now, private money, that's being pumped into uh, new ideas of fusion is very uh, exciting. So what we're doing uh, is following the White House uh, Fusion Summit held on March 13th, 17th, I've set up a fusion cross-cutting team and a leader in my office to coordinate the efforts across the department fusion, um, with regard to fusion, and future budgeting requests will be coordinated across the whole department to support the decadal uh, vision. So we are heavily com uh, committed to fusion, and we are following the advice of the, uh, the fusion advice, the FES, uh, Fusion and Energy uh, so, I shouldn't say society section. Anyway, FES, their advisory committee for the fusion energy, uh, their workshop in uh, 2022 that will be held to define the science and technology thrust for the IFE program with the Office of Science. So, fusion energy science is healthy, uh, uh, and but we need to be able to see how we can go further in fusion energy given the big changes that we've had uh, in even recent months with regards to accelerating the need for clean energy in areas like nuclear and also in fusion. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, yeah. for your indulgence. Yes. I yield back. The gentlelady from North Carolina, Ms. Ross, is now recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, thank you to Ranking Member Weber for holding this hearing today, and of course, thank you to Dr. Richmond for being with us today to share your insights about the Department of Energy's budget needs, which are considerable. Um, the hearing serves as a reminder that one of the most important end results of the competes USICA conference process should be robust funding for DOE. DOE's Office of Science projects at various stages of maturity have already been inhibited or stalled by the COVID pandemic, as we've heard from Dr. Richmond. And additionally, large scale projects are especially vulnerable to the fluctuation in annual budget and appropriations processes. As we move forward with the FY23 appropriations, funding levels should be cognizant of these specific challenges. And Mr. Chairman, before I ask my question, I ask unanimous consent to enter into the hearing record a statement for, from the American Society of Civil Engineers. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A few questions for Dr. Richmond. As we know, all industries have experienced supply chain issues as a result of the pandemic. If DOE is not funded adequately, what will this do to an already compromised supply chain? How will this impact the Office of Science 
construction and research projects. Well, thank you very much uh, for that question. And it is uh, one that we are very concerned about. Again, we, we do believe that with this uh, strong budget request that we will be able to address uh, many of these uh, supply chain issues. There are, however, even in the recent weeks, these changes that we see, particularly in the area of, uh, for example, in uh, isotopes, rare isotopes and also minerals, uh, where the Office of Science has spent a, a lot of uh, time and energy over the years in terms of coming up with new radionucleides and also their applications in a number of different areas. It's only been in the last few weeks that with the uh, fact that we're not going to be able to get many of these from Russia any longer, it's putting us in a critical state that this uh, that was not so apparent when this budget was put together. So there are concerns about our ability to to meet the needs of many of uh, for medical uses as well as technology as we go forward. And I hope to keep you uh, abreast of these uh, uh, of these our continuing thinking about this. Uh, but again, it was we're in the midst of this now, and it really uh, proceeds putting in with the budget. But I do, I do have to say that as we go forward, uh, that we really hope to be able to see the reconciliation bill go across the finish line, since uh, that last iteration included strong funding for lab infrastructure and also facilities, which could augment dollars, uh, which would be enormously helpful. And so we thank all of you for the efforts that you have put into this uh, and hope for some positive uh, news coming out of that. So that's just a follow up to your question. Happy to work with you further on this. Thank you and happy to be helpful. Um, last year, I introduced a bipartisan bill with Congressman Mayer, who's also on this committee, but not this subcommittee, to leverage federal resources to grow technology transfer programs and public-private partnerships to address climate change. Um, it addresses how uh, universities in the private sector could ca capitalize on DOE's research to accelerate the can commercial application of clean energy technologies. And I serve the research triangle area in North mm -hmm. Carolina. So this is so important to us. Um, can you speak to the importance of increasing government cooperation with our colleges, universities, and companies to catalyze clean tech innovation and how this also affects your budget? Yes, well, thank you for that question. And uh, you come from a beautiful part of the country, too. Uh, I've been there many times to visit and love it very much. Um, I believe that what we're doing here is uh, we have a number of different activities that are tying closely to trying to take scientific discovery into, by accelerating scientific discovery into uh, entrepreneurship as well as going into uh, academic institutions and also working with industry to make their science go further. And the Office of Science has really uh, opened its, its doors more widely than I've seen them before with this budget in order to try to accelerate the, uh, what's the, the research that's coming out of, of our universities uh, into uh, industry and even starting companies. You know, what really excites me in this area is that um, just how many young people get really excited about wanting to, to go to graduate school and then uh, start their own companies. And they're learning how to do that with programs that allow them, such as the Office of Science that allows them to think to think more broadly about what they are doing uh, beyond their own research. The Office of Science funds the basic research, uh, but it also fosters uh, those that are interested in also applying for patents and, and so forth. The message that I have been sending since I came into this uh, position is that what we want to do in the Office of Science is to make sure that our science has true impact and that that impact is not just measured by simple metrics of publications and citations that it truly is impact. And that, I believe, opens up the door for even our, uh, our, our faculty and universities, as well as in our government laboratories, to be thinking that, oh, I don't have to do the science, uh, that if my metrics are only based on publications, then should I be spending some of my time lo looking at entrepreneurial activities? And I've sent the very strong message that we, we want to embrace all of that, because if we're going to move forward, we need to have our science have an impact. Thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the responses, and I yield back. 
Thank you very much. I uh, need to make a slight course correction here. First of all, I want to apologize to Mr. Weber and my Republican colleagues. I was supposed to alternate questioners between Democrat and Republican. So to course correct, we're going to go back to back Republicans and then I'll fix the order going forward. So the gentleman from California, Mr. Garcia, is now recognized. Sorry about that, sir. Oh, no problem, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No offense taken at all. Uh, I apologize for not being there in person myself. Uh, well, I, uh, Dr. Richmond, first of all, thank you for the testimony. I'm, I'm a little bit concerned, and I'll share the sentiment of my constituents as well. I come from California, a beautiful part of the country, North LA County. Uh, but, un but unfortunately, we're, we're being absolutely crushed right now with energy prices. Um, I I'm concerned, and, and frankly, I'm a little more concerned even after your testimony, that, that we as a nation, after our population has, has nearly doubled over the last 40 years, our, our organic production of energy to meet the demands of that population in terms of energy consumption has not kept up. Uh, I, I'm, I'm extremely concerned and, and even more so today that we have become more dependent on, on other countries such as Russia, Venezuela, Middle Eastern nations such as Saudi Arabia for our energy needs because we've, we've committed to this war on American energy without having alternatives uh, in place to meet the demands that the, the current fossil fuel industry is, is meeting right now. Uh, and we're seeing massive problems in terms of affordability here in our own, in our own country. We're seeing gasoline prices in, in California that has a lot of gasoline uh, within its borders and underneath its ground, lots of oil reserves uh, at $6 to, to $6.50 a gallon. We're seeing even solar panels and uh, solar leases skyrocketing. Our, our electricity bills are, are anywhere from $300 to $800, depending on the, the size of the house. These are, these are massive problems in an inflationary period that is absolutely backbreaking to our, our constituents. And frankly, I think Americans around the country, uh, because we don't have the adequate resources and, and, and in my opinion, the ad adequate infrastructure needed to meet the, the energy demands of our people. We're also suffering from a lot of debt uh, at, at the national level, $30 trillion worth of debt. And, and I see increasing budgets uh, across the board. I hear complaints today in this uh, subcommittee hearing about not in increasing enough in certain areas, but I haven't heard where we've made cuts. I haven't heard what programs have been sacrificed so that we can pay the programs that are needed or where synergies or efficiencies have been gained in the last year and a half to two years out of DOE so that we can afford other technologies and investments in those technologies. Uh, and, and I feel like we're investing in some archaic uh, uh, designs, archaic technologies that frankly have, have proven that they can't meet the demands. And I, I haven't heard how we're going to address our, our dependency on China, our dependency on Russia. I haven't heard anything about new, next generation nuclear capabilities, alternative fuel cycles for those next generation uh, nuclear uh, uh, capabilities. Uh, and, and we're seeing relatively anemic uh, investments and increases in the investments for the, the actual sciences relative to some of these other uh, political platform issues that we've been discussing today. Um, so can you help me and alleviate some of these concerns and my constituents? How, how are we going to get pricing down uh, for our energy costs? How are we going to compete with, with Russia who has you know, developed 20 new nuclear reactors in the last uh, few years? They, they've now got $133 billion in back orders and what are we doing to, to, to invest in new technologies that actually allow us to recycle nuclear waste, recycle plutonium so we can have alternative fuel cycles uh, in support of next generation nuclear capabilities? Because uh, frankly, right now, the sum of the parts don't add up. Uh, we, we don't have enough energy to meet the demand and we continue to consume as a nation, but uh, fail to invest in, in, in capacity on the energy production side. So. Can you, can you please help mitigate this, this concern that I have and what's the long-term vision for this administration? Well, thank you for all those questions. <laughs> um, there are a lot of them. Uh, I wish I could take up every single one of them. Um, so let me just start big picture first um, because as you use, lose sleep over this, there are a lot of us that lose sleep over it too. Uh, especially how quickly things are changing. And what we're trying to do at the Department of Energy is to be smarter and more agile than we have ever been before. And so with this budget, uh, I believe that it is helping us be a new DOE, and I truly believe that, uh, that this is a new DOE because we are absolutely, can I say this, hell-bent 
on making sure that we can take the discovery science as quickly as possible to the applications and demonstration and then to deployment. And with the, the, uh, my infra the infrastructure bill that went through, uh, law that went through, it's really helping us, everyone see what the mission, what the mission is, but although the pathway is, so that we can get further along. With regards to nuclear and fusion, you know, I could talk about those singularly. We are absolutely on board with this, with regards to clean energy by nuclear as well as fusion. With the issue, uh, with the supply issues, we're working very diligently on making sure that we have enough of the uh, nuclear fuel to not only uh, keep our current nuclear uh, facilities going, but also for the future, and that also goes for security, what we need for uh, our security, uh, our security needs also, but also all the critical minerals. So even though I said this is a really phased transition from uh, these last few weeks, it isn't as if we've had our head in the sands on these for a long time. The Department of Energy has been working very hard. That said, because all that we do in the Office of Science is competitively uh, decided on who gets funding. It means that the best ideas, the new ideas that can transform the way we're going into energy and electricity, they are the ones that are being funded. They are the ones that are being funded. And now we have the capacity to move them further down the line to try to get to some of the solutions that we all have, but you in Southern California are particularly being hit by this, particularly in, in oil prices. So I guarantee you that every, every morning uh, we have a huddle with the secretary, the leadership team, and these are all the issues that we talk about. The gas prices, what they are today, and what we're anguishing over this, and how we're going to make sure that we can transition uh, to achieve the administration's goals in the long run to be at net zero uh, carbon. Thank you, Dr. Richmond. Look forward to seeing the solution soon. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. The gentleman from California, Mr. Obernalti, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Dr. Richmond, thank you very much for your obvious passion on these topics. Uh, I thought it was pretty remarkable in listening to the opening statements from both the chair and the ranking member of this subcommittee in that uh, they both expressed almost exactly the same sentiment, which is a, a concern that this budget request underinvests in the Office of Science. And I think uh, everyone on the subcommittee shares a passion for what your office does. I know you share that passion as well. Uh, Let's, let's start talking about uh, inflation, which obviously has been front of mind for a lot of us in Congress. Uh, I imagine that you prepared this budget with some estimates of inflation and its impacts. Uh, what were those estimates? Uh, that was at a time where I wasn't on board yet, so I don't know what those estimates were. I'm sorry, but I'm happy to get back to you uh, on what those estimates were. All right. So the Office of Science is requesting a 4.3% increase for this coming year, about 8.5%. So uh, I'm concerned that this budget actually represents a real, uh, a decrease in real dollars for the Office of Science based on the year before. Would you agree or disagree with that characterization? Well, I believe that this is a strong budget and uh, these inflation numbers are very serious and in some respects uh, have come very quickly upon us. I think that this uh, that it follows the priorities of the president's uh, budget and it is a framework. So I, I do look forward to working with you all and thank you for the support of the Office of Science and helping us to get further down this with these new challenges that we have. And again, I thank uh, uh, this committee for pushing so hard for the Office of Science as we take on these new challenges. All right, uh, well, I mean, with respect to the, the question I asked was, uh, does this represent a real dollar decrease in the budget for the Office of Science? Uh, I, th I think the the the, the answer, my answer to that question is, is yes, I think it does. No one knows with certainty what inflation will do next year, but it seems pretty clear that uh, it's going to be, on average, more than 4.3%. So uh, I know that you're in a difficult position here. You're, you're a passionate advocate, as we are, for these programs, and you, but yet you have to come and defend the administration's budget. Uh, we recognize that, but I mean, I, I think what you're seeing, hearing on a bipartisan basis is, please ask us for more money because these programs are vitally important and we think that they need to be properly funded. Um, talking specifically about fusion energy, I, I 
appreciate that you're saying that you're heavily committed to fusion. I think a um, majority of the people on this subcommittee would agree that that's going to be key to us meeting not only our, our climate change reduction goals, but also the, the, uh, the anti-poverty goals that we have for our constituents. Uh, one of the things I'm concerned about in this proposed budget is the funding for some of our user facilities, um, particularly one in California is uh, dealing with the computational support for fusion research, the National Energy Research Scientific Computing Center in California. Uh, you've proposed a decrease in their budget, I mean a decrease in actual dollars, which is a substantial decrease in real dollars, and these are facilities that are just struggling to to, uh, to stay open as it is. This is this particular one's the fifth fastest computer in the world. It's used by thousands and thousands of researchers. Uh, can you tell us why you're proposing a decrease in their budget? Well, this is uh, indeed difficult. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm a numbers person too, and I see those numbers. Um, but again, it was a matter of balancing out the priorities of the administration with regards to uh, climate issues. The facilities issues, uh, again, we were trying to maintain a strong uh, balanced portfolio that puts optimal funding for the facilities and the projects, tough decisions uh, having to be made. That said, by going through and very carefully uh, rebaselining a number of these facilities, we hope to be able to come up with a better idea of what the actual cost even taking into account uh, current inflation. We do. Uh, I love the facilities. Um, I, I could go on and on about uh, what the facil amazing facilities are doing, not only in computational areas, but also in issues of, of COVID, what we just did. And every, you know, every, every pill that has to be uh, put out on the market has to use one of our light source facilities in order to get okayed. You know, who, it was just so important. And so but we've had to make a balance with regards to coming up with a budget that fits uh, within the administration's uh, priorities. So again, I want to say thank you uh, for seeing the, uh, look forward to seeing the reconciliation bill uh, come through and other support that you're doing to make sure that we can get more funding for infrastructure. Well, I thank you for the testimony and I see I'm out of time, but please, if you would take this message back to the administration. Uh, we on a bipartisan basis think that you are underinvesting and uh, we would like you to see you ask us for more money, which is not something that you hear Congress saying very often. I yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Kasten, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Dr. Richmond. I'm a big fan of the Office of Science, uh, one-time beneficiary back in my research days and appreciate all that you do. Um, I, I think you're going to hear a broken record. You heard it from Mr. Obernolte. I think we're going to stay on this trend. But I, but I want to just share a story. When I, when I first got on this committee, um, the 116th Congress, the former president issued a budget that was basically one page long. And I remember sitting here in this room and listening to Secretary Perry justify that budget. And um, Mr. Perlmutter, who was sitting up here, asked him how he justified zeroing out huge parts of our space program. And his answer was, well, because we knew you'd restore it. And it was, it was disappointing. I remember th sitting there thinking as a new member of Congress, that doesn't sound like you did your job. But at least he told us what his ambition was. And my concern in listening to your testimony is that in talk, the presidential budget, the purpose is to describe your ambition. And hearing that this was constrained because of assumptions about fiscal trade-offs, that's our job. It's a hard job, but that's our job. Tell us what your ambition is. And I can't tell from this budget what the ambition is. Um, the, you know, I'm, I'm really concerned about the impact of this budget on large scale experiments and user facilities. We know that there's things that only DOE can do. You can use the light source to develop some wonderful new material that might be used as a cathode chemistry and a battery and then some other lab can figure out how to turn that into a whole piece of chemistry and another lab can figure out how to integrate this into vehicles. You can only do that at DOE labs. And if I'm reading this budget, you don't have account any accounting for the construction of major user facilities or large-scale experimental capabilities. So can you explain the department's logic in how those investments will get done without any budget increases? 
Well, thank you uh, for that question, and it certainly is one that uh, we've thought about a lot. In fact, I could go through the details of most all the constructions because we've looked at those and we believe that they will be able to go forward this, with this budget. Um, there are some that may be slowed down a bit because with this uh, budget, but other ones that have to, again, be re-baselined. I might put uh, uh, Dune into that uh, category. Uh, but on the other hand, we believe that we will be able to go forward on all of the um, uh, the projects that we have in place. Uh, some may be slowed down a bit, but they will go forward. Again, uh, that was the, uh, tr again, having to set priorities. With regards to uh, our, um, our labs and particularly our facilities, there may need to be a cutback in support in uh, some of the staffing that happens uh, if we, uh, unless we can figure out ways to have flexibility to be able to keep them going. Um, but this is a, you know, this is uh, again setting priorities that that are hard to do, and it's and very painful to do, and tough decisions and trade-offs. Well, well, if if, if I could, I, I've spent my entire career focused on climate. Mm -hmm. If we decide that the best time to act on climate is tomorrow, then we've repeated the mistakes of everybody who has ever held this job before. When I when I've, you know, the Argonne National Lab is right in my district, just just south of my district. I know the the. When I've spoken with them, they have said that basically the um, if if they followed the president's budget, they will be cutting cutting back on use at the at the advanced photon facility. I think you just said it. They will have to lay off. They will have to slow down experiments. Do we care about climate or not? And and again, put your ambitions out. Let us figure that out. But I but I sit here and say. And and if your answer to this is you need Congress to please upgrade your ambition, just ask. We'll do it. But I would like the president's budget to articulate that ambition, not to say that our goal in this moment in time is to kick the can down the road. We've been there, we've done that, we've proven it doesn't work. Well, thank you uh, for that comment, and thank you for all for everyone else that's spoken to this issue with regards to concern about the Office of Science budget. On the climate issue, because, and uh, that's where we are. And we do believe that it's a strong uh, request, but it requires setting priorities. Specifically on the issue of climate, we're not backing off on climate. The Office of Science has a lot of really fundamental research associated with climate, whether it be new materials for batteries, you, you know these issues, new materials for batteries, uh, anything having to do with, with uh, the atmosphere or especially right now with regards to supply uh, chain uh, issues and materials, but also fusion and nuclear. We're trying to go as hard as we can on these issues too. We are absolutely committed to the issue of, uh, of trying to <laughs> save the planet, to be well, quite I, frankly. I, I'm, I'm, I'm out of time, but I think just to state the obvious, if, if the people at Argonne are saying that this budget means we are going to shut down beam lines, that means we are going to slow the pace of discovery, and it's inconsistent with what you just said. Please be ambitious. Let us know how we can help. And I yield Thank you. Back. I look forward to working with all of you, believe me. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Jimenez, you are now recognized. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, our allies, France and the UK, routinely recycle their nuclear fuel. While they do not have geologic re repositories either, they, they don't have... Uh, the dispersed nuclear waste problem that has saddled greater deployment of nuclear power in, in America. In the face of recent energy crunch in Europe due to the underperformance of weather dependent renewables and Russia's invasion of Ukraine, France recently announced that they will be deploying 14 new reactors, the first of which will be uh, coming online in the early 2030s. The UK has also joined the race and declared that they will add eight new reactors, which will supply 25% of their anticipated demand growth. Meanwhile, Russia and China are racing to develop nuclear recycling facilities. China is constructing uh, two demonstration plants right now. Uh, we don't have any say over their safeguards implementation and without serious commitment in such technology development and commercialization here at home, we won't have any say when other nations and what other nations will seek to do uh, with that in the near future. It's time that we uh, reinvigorate uh, nuclear recycling R&D in the United States. In largesse of a federal budget, such R&D spending won't amount to, to say more than $50 million annually. This is quite small compared to the 
you know, plus $1 billion that the federal government spends annually in liability payments due to its failure to take custody of nuclear waste. I want to uh, add that the department's um, ARPA E office has shown great courage and foresight in funding nuclear waste recycling R&D in the last couple of years. So what sort of infrastructure and spending levels are necessary to seriously reinvigorate this research and development in the United States? Thank you for that question. Anybody can answer. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so we are taking very seriously uh, the issue of the need for nuclear energy and more and built and uh, expanding our nuclear uh, capabilities for power plants. Um, in fact, we have just a phenomenal new uh, uh, leader in our nuclear energy area, uh, Katie Huff, and she has really been pushing on how we not only um, uh, put forth demo new demonstration nuclear projects as well as to be able to plan forward for keeping our nuclear power plants in place. These don't happen, of course, overnight. And in fact, to be able to have the smaller modular nuclear power plants that we hope to have, uh, we need to uh, do a demonstration project in order to do that, and that we're working very actively on. Uh, we know that the issue of uh, uh, nuclear waste is a huge uh, topic that we need to be concerned about, and we're actively working on that, too. Uh, our environmental management group is, is uh, working very hard on this, as well as in the areas of both the Office of Science and the applied uh, applied programs uh, to it, sort of across the, the spectrum. So uh, we've, we're on it. We're working hard on it. Again, uh, there's, it's a complex issue with regards to where things get cited, as well as working with uh, different um, companies that want to be involved in doing this. Uh, and that's what we're putting a lot of our energy into now, is to be able to find partners that we can work with in order to advance our nuclear program in the country. How quickly do you think you can get some of these demonstrations up and running? Well, we're hoping we're hoping in the next several years, in the next couple of years, because uh, they, you know it really depends a lot on, in some respects, uh, our ability to produce HALU, which we're going to need for the uh, smaller demonstration projects, and and that then goes back to the issue of uh, limited uranium, uh, limiting now our uranium supplies from from Russia. So it, it's something I've been actively working on, both with the Under Secretary for NNSA as well as myself, uh, uh, to and and in order to uh, work on that problem right now, which is what we're, we're really, uh, we really need to figure out for both the HEU as well as LEU as well as HALU. And so I'm hoping uh, we can make progress, but we first have to make sure that we got, got the fuel to, uh, in place that allow us to run these demonstration projects. Now, in regards to the companies developing the technology for the, the handling of the, of the waste, how can we make sure that companies developing these technologies are not hindered by the lack of facilities uh, which the federal government should be making available in our national laboratories. Well, that, uh, that's another uh, complicated issue too, and I'd be happy to work with you and, and others to figure out the best uh, solution on this as we go forward, because you are, uh, Congress is an important player in this too, because this is really a national issue, uh, as well as this is a site-specific issue. Thank you, ma'am. My time is out, and I yield back. The gentlelady from Oregon, Ms. Bonamici, is now recognized. Thank you, Chair Bowman and, and Ranking Member Weber. Dr. Richmond, it's great to see you again. Uh, and uh, our nation's fortunate to have you in this critical role, but I have to say that you are certainly missed at the University of Oregon. Uh, so I want to commend the department for announcing the $84 million for the new research initiative involving urban integrated field laboratories. Uh, I know the research will partly focus on stimulating the benef uh, simulating the benefits of deploying climate solutions in historically underserved communities. And this work is particularly important for Oregonians. As uh, you know, we had an unprecedented heat dome in the Pacific Northwest last year. So I'm pleased to see that the department uh, hopes to award funding for this initiative in this fiscal year, and also that the FY23 budget request proposes additional funds for this program. And I know you heard the support here on both sides of the aisle for um, investing uh, in your department. So what other steps is the department taking to incorporate environmental and energy justice in the climate-related work it supports. And additionally, how can we make sure that that research uh, is reaching the communities that need it the most? 
Well, thank you uh, for that question. It's great to see you again, uh, too. You know, there's one thing I have, have not really highlighted uh, in telling you what we're doing, and this gives me an opportunity to do that, and that is the earth shots. And so these earth shots are, are, are really uh, what, you know, what we've set as a priority in the Office of Science, and these earth shots are to be able to, to solve, uh, in a decadal time frame, critical technical issues around climate change. And so we have three of these earth shots that we have uh, announced. Carbon capture uh, from the atmosphere, long-term storage, and long-term storage, and oh god, I sleep with this every day on hydrogen. <laughs> H2 and hydrogen. Um, and, and all of these three, and these are major projects that go all the way across the Department of Energy, but they're based in the Office of Science. And in all of these three, we are uh, working environmental justice into all of these. In all of the roadmaps that we're developing, which go from very fundamental research to applied research, uh, that we are taking into account environmental justice and urban-related uh, issues. And I apologize to Hydrogen for, for forgetting. <laughs> no, no worries. In fact, I want to follow up on one of those. We, we know that uh, storage is, is, is so key mm -hmm. to maximizing renewable energy use and decarbonizing our economy. So the Energy Storage Grand Challenge, I know, that's mm -hmm. that cross-cutting effort to help us achieve this goal by accelerating the development and commercialization of next generation storage technologies. So can you give us an update on the status of that program and summarize future plans for the Energy Storage Grand Challenge? And then also I'd like an update on how the uh, Exascale initiative is going. Well, they, um, with regards to the um, uh, long-term duration storage, that again is uh, being one of the earth shots means that we are highlighting it uh, as much as possible in the science that's done in the Office of Science. In fact, we're starting a series of of uh, uh, requests for energy frontier uh, centers, uh, energy centers, that will allow us to put together groups of teams from the national laboratories as well as universities in order to go forward on this long duration storage. And this will take people that are not only working on what new materials can be used uh, to, in order to make effective long-term uh, battery storage, but also just you know the fundamental issues, but also taking it to the applied areas where then they can actually be developing prototypes or, or um, or different ways in which you can use these new materials in batteries and then test them out. You know, one of the big challenges is, to, is lithium, and so what we, uh, lithium in, in the batteries, and in fact, what we've been working on a lot is, and this goes back to critical minerals, it's all tied together, is how we can, the United States can produce its own degree of lithium rather than being dependent on many other countries. So that's sort of a sidebar too, but it shows how all of these things are interconnected that we're talking about with regards to the issues of the Office of Science, but also in the applied areas. And so we would be happy to work with you to keep you abreast of what's going on with the uh, long duration storage as well as any of the other ones. But I'm really, really excited about these earth shots. I've worked very hard on these because I think that, they are the, that these are the three areas and others to be announced later, which are cross-cutting across the agency, which we have put, we have uh, added considerable funding in the Office of Science Thank for. You. And in, in the remaining few seconds, how's the Exascale initiative going? Oh, the Exascale initiative is, is continuing to proceed uh, really, really important as we look to both uh, beef up our capabilities in the uh, national laboratories as well as across the academic area. And again, an exciting, uh, another very exciting area uh, for exascale computing for us. Terrific, and just a few seconds left, so I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Meyer, is now recognized. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Foster, is now recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, um, um, I, well, first off, I'm just going to repeat the broken record here about the, the fact that the, you know, the budget here is not adequate. You know, when people worry that we're falling behind other countries, mm -hmm. the metric that they point to is the fraction of GDP uh, devoted to R&D, mm -hmm. the so-called research intensity. Uh, and this is the fair and the correct metric. Uh, so if you look at, at the situation in the United States, GDP growth is not the problem. And we're seeing 5.7% GDP growth, real GDP growth under Biden, faster than China. 
Uh, and in fact, I think most of us were amused to see uh, President Xi ordering all of his uh, underlings to cook the books to make China's growth at least appear a little bit better than um, the U.S. under Biden. The wealth in, and debt in the U.S. is not a problem. Uh, since the start of the Obama recovery, the wealth of Americans has increased from $60 trillion to $150 trillion. That's an increase of $90 trillion. Trillion, not billion, trillion. And of course, most of this is piled up in the, in the, in the pockets of the wealthiest among us. Uh, in fact, the top 10 fortunes, if you look at the top 10 fortunes, nine out of 10 of those are directly attributable to federally funded technology. Uh, and, and yet we somehow um, can't seem to find a way as a society to allocate the same fraction of GDP to federally funded research that um, other countries that are starting to outperform us do. Uh, and, and I think Representative Obernolte, uh, Ranking Member Obernolte, my ranking member on our subcommittee, uh, was correct in pointing out that the 4.3% budget increase uh, for um, Office of Science uh, after an 8.5% inflation represents a cut. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to, I think it's a mathematical fact. Um, and in fact, doubling the budget of the science uh, enterprise in this country is not enough. In the, if inflation continues that way. You know, if it's 8% inflation for a decade, that is a factor of two. So we could succeed in doubling the budget of science uh, and in not even tread water. Uh, so, and so the goal should be to double the budget as a fraction of GDP. And we should always frame it that way and we should deliver it that way. And that should be the responsibility of, of uh, everyone on, on both the uh, authorization and appropriations committees. Now, um, when you, I was in, in really uh, very happy to see you mention that you were going to be rebase lining um, all these projects because they got planned with a certain, to deliver a certain uh, scientific scope uh, and uh, under a certain real budget and then got walloped by, by COVID, by uh, you know, the, all the supply chain delays, by uh, the standing army problems just related to delays, as well as unexpectedly high inflation. So when you rebaseline them, my, I would request that you please rebaseline them to the, restore the original scientific scope, okay? That's not gonna be the first reaction because the numbers are gonna be significant when you restore the full scope and a healthy project contingency, which is another way that you might be tempted to scrimp. So please do that honestly. And then another request, which we'll never be able to follow up and, and oversee you on, is that you know there's a, internally to the administration and the agencies, there's this pass-back procedure, which at least used to happen around Thanksgiving, and I don't know how it's going these days. But, the, um, but in, the, in those situations, when the administration proposes high-level allocations to you, you have, your job is to honestly deliver, uh, to, to tell them what you can really deliver for that allocation, and then come back to, to Congress and make sure you have a consistent picture, that, that the budget decisions that are made are at least consistent with reality. And you know, I think that's been slipping a little bit under in the last decade. That it's, but it's very important for us to know that if we don't allocate enough money, we're going to have a second rate science program and some projects that will fail uh, for sure to deliver themselves on time and on budget. And so that, so be, you know, show some, um, uh, well, if not some uh, stiffness of spine, some at least some viscosity of spine in <laughs> in these negotiations with the administration, because I know they're really tough. But it's it's an important part of your job to make sure that the administration, you know, is dealing honestly with the the sacrifices that they're asking you to make when they. Now tell you to stand up and, and deal with a 4.3% increase that doesn't cover inflation. So anyway, um, I think I've pretty well um, used up my time here, but if I just want to thank you for the tough job you've come on and, and you know, fight like heck. We're, on the yeah. same, we're, all, we're all on the same side here. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I take your advice. I t will take it back and I'll fight like hell too. Okay. I'll fight like hell too. Thank you, mm -hmm. yield back. You know, but uh, can I just say for a minute that, you know, our facilities, our labs, really are the jewels in the crown. And we have to make sure that they stay that way. While other countries, such as China, are emulating what we have in our facilities and our labs, we can't lose that. We can't lose that. I agree completely. Yep. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Foster. Are there any members who would like to participate in a second round of questions? Okay. Before we bring the hearing to a close, I want to thank Dr. Richmond for testifying before the committee today. The record will remain open for two weeks for additional statements from the members and for any additional questions the committee may ask of the witness. The witness is excused and the hearing is now adjourned.